Hey guys, what's up? Today I'm going to be sharing my comparison of three very exciting new cameras. We've got the Sony a7 III that was just announced today. We've got the Fujifilm X-H1 announced last week and the Panasonic G9 which was announced very late last year. Now all these cameras come in under two grand. There's a little bit of a price difference. The, the low end is the Panasonic at 1700. The Fujifilm is 1900 and the, the Sony is right at 1999. Um, but you're gonna see in this, in this comparison, I put this table together here. I'm going to be stepping through the features, kind of highlighting the differences and kind of sifting through the different priorities of these cameras to see, you know, which one is better for image quality, which one's better for sports, which is better for video. Um, just kind of figuring out maybe which of these cameras is best for you. So stay tuned and enjoy. All right, first up is the price. Now it's it's essentially a wash here. The Sony is two grand, the Fujifilm is 1900, and the Panasonic is 1700. But by the time you build out a lens system and get some accessories, I mean you're just talking kind of pennies here. I hate to say, by the time you get two, three, four lenses, you're in multiples of what these bodies can cost in some cases, especially with the Sony. So going into that, we have the weight. The Fujifilm is the heaviest at 673 grams. The Sony is right behind at 650. And the Panasonic is a featherweight 579 grams. So the Panasonic, you're gonna have the lightest lenses and the lightest body. Even though it's a pretty big chunky body, you're gonna have the lightest system, especially with the smaller lenses. And the Sony, the body is, is 650, which isn't too bad. It's going to be kind of small and dense. But the lenses, you're going to have some big, heavy glass on this thing. All these new fast aperture Sigma lenses, you know, they're big telephotos, the, the G, GM series. You're going to have a pretty heavy kit with the Sony. What is probably the biggest differentiating factor between these cameras is the sensor size. Now the Sony a7 III has a 24 megapixel full frame backside illuminated sensor. Very impressive. Uh, the Fujifilm X-H1 has the APS-C sensor, 24 megapixels X-Trans, and the Panasonic has a 20 megapixel micro four third sensor. Now the autofocus system, the Sony has a 693 point hybrid phase detect system. 93% coverage should be very, uh, very effective at continuous tracking. The Fujifilm X-H1 also has a hybrid phase detect on sensor system with 325 points. And the Panasonic G9 has a 225 point contrast detect only depth from defocusing system. All right, video capabilities, frame rates, resolutions. These cameras all shoot 4K although only the Panasonic G9 manages 60 frames per second in 4K. That could be very attractive for some people, especially those who want slow motion 4K. It's really the only one of these cameras that can do slow motion 4K. Um, it can also manage 180 frames per second at 1080p, whereas the other two can do 120 at 1080p. Now the caveat to that is the G9 cannot autofocus above 60 frames per second. It cannot do any kind of autofocus in those slow motion 1, 180, 120 frames per second, cannot do autofocus. The Sony can do autofocus at 120 frames per second. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, you go into video crop. <clears throat> if you're shooting 4K at 30 frames per second in the Sony, you have a very small 1.2X crop. If you're shooting 24p, you have no crop. If you're shooting 1080p, you have no crop at all. The Fujifilm X-H1 has a has a also minor 1.17x crop in 4K, regardless of frame rate, and no crop at all in 1080p. And the G9 has no crop no matter what you're shooting, 4K 60, 4K 30, 1080p 180, 120, 60, whatever, no crop at all from the G9. Now some notes on video, the Sony has 4K HDR, it has S-Log 2 and 3, it has hybrid log gamma. As mentioned, it does manage autofocus, continuous autofocus with 1080p at 120 frames per second. So a pretty comprehensive uh, video package on the A7, did not expect to see S-Log in there, but there it is. And the X-H1, um, what's really interesting, this is the first Fuji camera that can do the dynamic range expansion modes, the DR200, DR400, in video. Now if you like the look that gives to your JPEG shots on the on the Fuji, it's gonna look really nice in video. I really think of all the all three of these cameras just based on the, the history and what we've seen from past models, 
the Fujifilm is going to have the best output straight out of the camera and stills and video just with the best color, the, the best um, tonality and, and fall off. That's not to say the Sony can't look better. I'm sure it can, but maybe with a little bit of tweaking. Uh, anyways, the Fuji does have F-Log, which is their, their flavor of, of log, of their flat profile that's in camera, does not require a battery grip like it did on the X-T2. Big thumbs up for that. However, maybe this is part of the X-Trans processing power or something. They could not manage uh, zebra warnings, any overexposure warnings on the X-H1 during recording. Now this is something I see even here in my G85, a pretty lower spec camera can easily manage uh, zebras to gauge your exposure. So that's, that's a notable omission on the X-H1. Now none of these cameras are going to be for really, really serious videographers because they don't offer 10-bit. They don't offer a uh, 422 in camera. They're not going to be spec'd like a, a GH5 or a GH5S. So, uh, but I think they offer enough. <clears throat> Anyways, the G9 has no V-log, has no autofocus above 60 frames per second. So with the G9, you're getting the benefit of no crop whatsoever. You're getting those high frame rates, but you're not getting log. You're not getting HDR, anything fancy like that built in. Um, so your benefit is going to be on the frame rates and the lack of crop. Now moving on to audio, both the Sony and the Panasonic have proper headphone and mic jacks. Although the, the uh, Fujifilm does not have a headphone jack, it only has a mic jack. So if you want a headphone jack on the Fujifilm, you have to get the grip with it and plug into the headphone jack on the grip. Kind of annoying that they didn't add that. Considering the size of the camera, you, you think they could have squeezed it in somewhere, but they did not. Uh, one interesting thing, though, about the X-H1 is Fujifilm in the press release went out of their way to say it has high-quality internal microphones, so I don't know exactly what that means. I, I, I do know the microphones in my G85, the built-in ones, are pretty crappy, so that's why I'm using this, uh, this Rode Video Micro. It gives me a little bit more of a crisper sound. Um, so, you know, if the X-H1 really does have high-quality onboard mics, that's great. Um, kind of remains to be seen, though. I have to do some testing. The rear LCD, there's not a big difference between the size and the resolution. You know, the Sony is 640 by 480, the Fuji and the Panasonic are 720 by 480. Uh, not really top spec panels here. You're not getting RGBW, you're not getting a really high resolution like the Nikon D500. Really hoping that would have trickled down to some other cameras, but it really hasn't. Um, now the Sony just have a, a, a display that can tilt up and down. The Fuji can tilt up and down, but it can also tilt off to the side. So if you're shooting portrait, you can tilt it up so you can, you can look um, and see it in the right way. The Panasonic has a fully articulating, swiveling, swivel out screen, which is nice. Like right now I'm vlogging on my JD5. I can see myself. I can see that, okay, now I'm on this side. Now I'm on that side. Um, now with the Sony and the Fuji, you can have a smartphone or a tablet up that can show you a live stream over Wi-Fi, so it's not that big of a deal. But if you vlog a lot, the G9 will definitely have an advantage in that department. Okay, now the EVF. Now this is an area where unfortunately Sony had to cut some costs to get this camera under, under two grand at this price point. It's not a bad EVF, 2.36 million dot. 60 hertz that's the spec of the the evf on my g85 which is which is fine it's a beautiful evf and it's a 0.78 times magnification on the a7 which is pretty good um, very competitive the fujifilm and the panasonic have much higher resolution 3.69 3.68 million dot evfs they also have higher refresh rates the fujifilm comes in at 100 frames per second and the g9 max is out at 120 frames per second uh, the G9 also has a huge EVF. It's so big that there's actually a button on the side of it that can reduce it from 0.83, which is the max magnification, down to 0.77 and then down to 0.70. So if you have eyeglasses, you actually can't get your eye close enough to the viewfinder to see the whole image. Um, so it's a big, beautiful EVF. However, I have heard that it has some like pincushion distortion and some softness towards the extreme corners. Probably not that big of a deal, but it's just just goes to show that it's not perfect. Uh, the Fujifilm has a relatively low magnification, 0.75x, but of course it has that nice high resolution and the pretty fast 100 frames per second refresh rate. 
Okay, so now moving on to something that's really nice to see in mirrorless cameras now is IBIS, in-body image stabilization. The Sony has five stops, the Fuji has 5.5 stops, and the Panasonic has 6.5 stops. So, you know, not a huge difference, but if you think about it, the Panasonic can probably manage like four or five seconds hand-holding without any shake. That's pretty good. I mean, I can manage two seconds with my G85 if I'm if I'm really lucky. So, you know, you get better stabilization with the G9, and <clears throat> Panasonic has a lot of experience with it. I think they've really refined it very well. Um, and that, that kind of shows off in the next thing, the high resolution sensor shift. This is something that Olympus has done for a while on the OMD EM1 Mark II. Pentax has done with the pixel shift. Um, Sony does it on the A7R3, but not the A7 III. You're not seeing it on the Fujifilm either, so what it does is it shifts the sensor eight times in half pixel increments to give you either a 40 or an 80 megapixel JPEG or RAW file. Um, this has to be done on completely static subjects. You're gonna have some artifacts and some zigzags, but it can, it's a really nice way to get some really good high resolution shots for landscapes, for interiors, anything that doesn't move. It's nice having that option and it apparently it, it does it pretty quickly it, it shifts it pretty fast and processes it pretty fast so it's nice to have that on the panasonic now all three of these cameras can charge their internal batteries on usb but only the fuji and the panasonic can charge and run simultaneously over usb 3 uh, so that's that's just something to keep in mind but I'm glad to see that. That's, that means if you're going hiking, that's one less thing to take along as a battery charger, and especially like buying a separate USB battery charger like I had to do for my J85. Uh, moving on, and well, going along with hiking, it can be very good to have a weather sealed camera. My G85 is fully weather sealed, and this 12 to 60 kit lens is weather sealed. I've taken it out, gotten it snow all over it, gotten it wet, you know, shot in the rain, just fine. So that's what's sad about the Sony. It's pretty marginal weather sealing. The gaskets and the build is not quite as robust as the other two. The other two are very proven. They have many weather sealed lenses to go along with them. Now a big sticking point with mirrorless cameras has always been the battery life, but here the Sony really knocks it out of the park. Despite having a big power hungry full frame sensor, they manage a 610 shot CIPA rating very impressive, especially considering it's basically double the 310 shot limit of the X-H1. The G9 has a 400 shot, give or take, limit. However, if you use eco mode, which I use on my G85 all the time, it extends that to 890 shots. So depending on your use, you could actually get better battery life with the Panasonic than the Sony. But because it's a SEPA standard, I, I, I give the advantage to the Sony here because that's assuming it's running at full power without having to to shut off and cycle like the Panasonic does in eco mode. Uh, something else that the Fuji and the Panasonic have is a top LCD, very nice to have. You're looking down, you got your settings right there. Very quick and easy access. Uh, they're both illuminated. W one trick that the Fuji has is the top, the top LCD is on even if the camera is off. So you can look down, you can see what your settings are without having to power on your camera and check. So that, that's a nice little perk. The Sony, as compact as it is, it doesn't really have space for a, uh, a top LCD, so it, it goes without. All right, build quality. Uh, I haven't seen any shots of the a7 III completely stripped down, but looking at it, looking at the a7 II, I'm just going to assume that it has the same construction. So you get a magnesium alloy um, top and front, but the back is polycarbonate. If you get the A7R3 and the A7S, they, they're fully magnesium all the way around, but I'm pretty sure the A7 III is going to be built like the A7 II. It's going to be a mixture of composite on the back and magnesium elsewhere, which isn't bad. But just keep in mind that the Fuji and the Panasonic are top-end flagship bodies. They are fully magnesium all the way around, all the sides, top and bottom. So probably between that and the weather sealing on the Fuji and the Panasonic, they're going to be the more robust camera. But that's not to say the Sony is at all cheap. I've, I've picked up even the original A7. It feels like a tank. It, it, it really feels solid. Okay, now we get to what I call the Achilles heel section. Now, 
I don't want to use the word deal breaker, but this is probably the, the one thing when I look at these cameras individually that sticks out as a problem, something that could keep you from actually buying one, maybe make you look somewhere else. So the Sony, this was apparent during the... So the Sony, th this was apparent right away when DP Review released their sample image album of the studio shots of the A7. You see this shot of the model with this backlight behind her, and you see these really sharp pixely artifacts and what these are this is light scattering off those phase detect sensors on the uh, the full frame sensor the, f the phase detect pixels all 693 of them so you could see a lot of these things so I mean these are only in certain backlit conditions it's not something you're going to see all the time but depending on how you use this camera it really could be a problem so it it's not we, we don't really know if this is something that Sony can fix or they intend to fix or if it's just something you'll just have to work around and live with but it's just something I wanted to mention and the Fuji th this is nothing new some people just really hate the X-Trans sensor they just can't work with it they don't want to have to ditch their raw converter and use something else and find out oh this one handles noise better this one handles detail better blah 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 it's it's an esoteric layout and it requires some finesse and processing it. You can get these kind of wormy looking details, you can get these um, these grids, these purple flare grids, magenta um, like a screen door pattern under certain lighting so you kind of get the same artifacts that, that could also be partly due to the PDA, the phase detect PDAF sensors as well that screen door effect. The Panasonic doesn't have those artifacts, but if you're doing any kind of raw processing on the G9, I noticed this and a few other people did in the DP review exposure latitude test the G9. This thing cannot stand up to shadow pushing. I mean, I'm showing you here an extreme case of a 5 EV push, but look at the G85. Look what I'm using now with the older 16 megapixel sensor. You don't have this like huge magenta color shift. It looks absolutely terrible in the G9, and I'd have to be out of my mind to spend $1,700 to downgrade like this. So I, I don't know what's going on here, but it, it's it's part of the reason I'm doing this video, guys. Like I, I thought I was going to get a G9, but I saw this, and the Sony comes out, and the Fuji comes out. And I'm thinking maybe I should wait. Maybe I should just wait and see what happens because I I just cannot. I really don't consider that an upgrade. You know. There are many things that are better about the G9, but I do a lot of raw processing. I do a lot of shadow pushing when I do landscape shooting. And if I'm getting these like horrendous magenta color shifts, that's just gonna be a nightmare to process that out. It's, ne it's never gonna look right. Yeah, I kind of dwelled on that a bit, but I'm, I'm really hoping Panasonic can do a firmware update or something to fix that. Okay, so I just want to wrap up real quick. The Sony, it's it's has proficient, fast, proven AF. It has eye tracking AF, very handy for portrait shooters. Has a large full frame sensor. You're getting the biggest sensor with the Sony, the biggest sensor in the smallest body, but not not too small of a body. Um, and what's good about that sensor is you can plunk on some old vintage 35 millimeter uh, film era glass and you're not getting a huge crop factor like you know with my Panasonic if I if I put on like a Minolta 50 millimeter it becomes a hundred it's like everything is a telephoto but with the Sony you can put on all your old lenses and they're they're true to their original intended focal length you're not getting any kind of cropping if you shoot Canon you can use a Metabones adapter you can plug your Canon lenses onto your Sony a7 you can still get autofocus and aperture it's, it's just like you're shooting with your Canon basically so it's very adaptable it's a good way to transition somebody from a Canon system to a Sony system is with that adapter and they slowly build up their Sony lenses or Sigma lenses however the the disadvantages are the size and cost of the body and lens combinations you're gonna have that compact a7 body but you're gonna have some big heavy glass hanging off the front of it you're gonna have a big heavy kit so you know, if you do a lot of like street shooting, it could be nice and small. You could put a little 35 1.8 on there, 35 1.4, pretty nice and handy, discreet. But you get into these like 2.8 zooms and 1.4 primes, and it's getting pretty, pretty big and heavy, a lot to lug around. 
Moving on to the Fujifilm, you're probably going to get the best output of this camera straight out of the camera without any kind of processing. That's JPEGs, that's your movie files, using that new Eterna film emulsion preset, using the 400%, 200% DR expansion modes in video. So they really throw in a lot to give you just really pleasing out of camera results. I think wedding photographers are really going to like the Fuji. And the other thing is just the, the lineup of lenses on the Fuji on the Fuji cameras is just outstanding. You get these awesome fast primes like the 16mm f1.4, the 23mm f1.4, the 56mm f1.2, and we have these, these lenses on the horizon now. We have a 200mm f2, this big honking fast telephoto, and then we have an 8 to 16mm f2.8 ultra wide, ultra wide zoom with a 2.8 aperture. So that's going to be very compelling too. So the, the Fujifilm XF lens lineup, it's just awesome, top performing, sharp lenses. They're not really horrendously expensive. They're going to be cheaper than your, your, uh, your high-end Sony lenses. Um, in some cases, cheaper than the high-end Micro Four Thirds lenses. Like you compare the 56 millimeter F1.2, which comes in at 999, against the Panasonic Leica 42.5 millimeter f1.2, which is what, like 1299 or 1499? It's quite a bit more, despite being made for a smaller sensor. But um, anyways, the XF lens lineup on the Fuji is definitely a plus. Now, what might turn some people off is the X-Trans sensor. The battery life is the lowest this bunch by quite a bit. And this camera kind of conflicts with itself in a way because of the control dial setup. When you're having a camera that's really trying to push the cutting edge in terms of speed and, and capability, and you have this dial arrangement from the 70s, you know, sometimes you just want to, you know, have your eye up and just quickly dial something in. And the Fuji system, you have to, I guess there's some feel involved to it, but it, it's different. It's kind of meant for a slower pace of shooting. So you have your dials that are meant for a slower pace of shooting. You have a camera that can shoot 14 frames per second with continuous tracking, has all these video functions. I don't know, it just, can, it just kind of seems to conflict with itself in my mind that way. And lastly, the Panasonic G9, it's built for speed, it's built for telephoto shooting, it's built for birding, action. It can shoot 20 frames per second with continuous autofocus, 60 frames with locked autofocus. I think it's the best option here for somebody who wants to shoot telephoto and not have a big, heavy, big, heavy telephoto lenses. They, you know, maybe they're an older retired guy who likes to go birding but doesn't want to kill his back and wants, you know, a nice 100 to 400 like the Panasonic Leica. I think it's going to be a good option for that. It's also the only option here that has 4K 60 frames per second. That's still a pretty exclusive club to be in, and. You know, Panasonic now makes three cameras that can do that, the G9, the GH5, and the GH5S. Sony still doesn't have any of them, even, even the uh, A7R3. Now, the upcoming A7S3, I'm, I'm betting it's going to have it. I'm pretty sure it will. But right now, they don't have anything with 4K60. And right here, the Panasonic does. Um, but like I said earlier with the Achilles heel, the, the sensor performance on the G9 just kills me. I mean, it's... You know, I, I say I say it's enough. I, I said my G85 is enough. I take shots like this. It's a 40 by 30, 16 megapixel. I took this with my 25 millimeter f0.95. It looks great, but I'm looking at this the shadow recovery case. It looks like a big step back with the G9. It's like, what the heck? What were they thinking? How could they let this pass? So I, I really have some issues with the image quality and the, the raw flexibility on the G9. As it stands now, it kills it for me. I'm just going to say it, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I feel like I'm betraying you. I did all these videos on Micro Four Thirds. Now the G9 comes out. I get excited about it. And then this, this issue comes up, and it's like, whoa, what in the heck is going on? So maybe as bad as it is, I kind of wonder if they're working on something, if maybe they didn't have it tuned properly, and they're going to issue a firmware update, get it fixed, get the color cast gone. But at this point, I just cannot, I can't bet on that. I can't dive into the G9 and hope they're going to fix it. Frankly, guys, right now I, I'm just kind of overwhelmed with choices. I, I, you know, I still have Pentax stuff to sell for my K52s kit, so I think I'm just going to try to enjoy photography, take more shots like this, get out with my G85, do some hiking, um, 
keep selling off my Pintech stuff and 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 really I, I, these these are great options. Uh, thanks for hanging in if you've made it this far. I know I, I tend to ramble a lot, but I have a lot to say. I've, I've done a lot of research on these cameras, and I hope that this table especially, I mean, just ignore everything I've said and just look at this table. Maybe this will help you. You can look at this and just at a glance see what, what are the strengths and weaknesses of these cameras. All right, guys, thanks again, and happy shooting. Catch you later.